Okay, thank you. So I was saying I oversimplified my presentation, but the idea was to give you an overview of the projects that are running uh, in our laboratory and that aim to uh, improve bioremediation and current production by a particular bacteria, which is called Geobacter sulfurudescens, which has a great uh, respiratory versatility in terms that this bacteria can use several uh, electron donors and receptors. So this is not a great novelty because several bacteria can do this. But interesting, uh, one interesting aspect on this bacteria is that it can use either a soluble electron receptors or unsoluble, unsoluble ones. So here I'm just showing uh, uh, two examples. So th these are grow curves in, present of a, in presence of a soluble receptor and in soluble ones. So the bacteria can grow, can utilize both. But in this case, it takes much more time to grow. So in presence of uh, extracellular receptors, the bacteria, the, the grow rates are s s smaller. Another interesting aspect is on this bacteria is that they also can grow on the electrode surfaces. And by doing this, they can produce current. So we have the cells, we have a carbon source, and you can measure current production. And when uh, they consume all the carbon uh, source, if you have more carbon source, you get a current production again. So these features was uh, designated as one of the 50 best inventions or discoveries in 2009. So what we have, we have bacteria that can use extracellular receptors. So they are able to uh, send electrons outside the cell. And uh, nowadays, there are several uh, biotechnological applications that are based on this uh, feature. So we can have applications in the bioremediation field, for instance, uh, these bacteria can reduce uh, soluble form of uranium-6 and get it to insoluble uh, state. And therefore, uranium will precipitate in the more confined region and will be much easier to remove, remove the precipitated uranium from contaminated groundwater's environments. Another application is, as I, I mentioned before, the current production by microbiofuel cells which are uh, this kind of de devices that uh, we have here. So we have an anode chamber and a cathodic chamber. The bacteria can grow on the surface of a graphite uh, electrode by consuming uh, uh, carbon sources and sending electrons to this uh, electrode. You can get electricity from, from this process. And more recently, we have another application that is called microbioelectrosynthesis, which is more or less the opposite to the, the, to the, the way it works uh, microbiofuel cells, in the sense that you can get from <coughs> solar energy, you can produce electrons, and you can inject those electrons into the bacteria. And by injecting those electrons, the bacteria can favor some metabolic pathways that will lead to the production of biofuels or other bioorganic bio molecules that could have some commercial uh, value. Uh, <clears throat> so at this point, what we have, we have uh, a bacteria that can send electrons outside, and we have a lot of applications based on this uh, feature. Uh, what I'd like to show now is what this bacteria has compared to the other ones that cannot uh, send electrons to outside the cell. So the genome of the, the, this bacteria is already sequenced and there is a genetic system available. And by doing several gene knockout and proteomic studies, uh, we, we and our collaborators, of course, discovered that this bacteria has a lot of cytochromes, which are proteins involved in the electron transfer. So they have more than 100 cytochromes. And by uh, knock, knocking out some of these uh, proteins, they found that we have cytochromes that are involved in the electron transfer pathways that lead to the current production. 
cytoplasms involved in the pathways that lead to the reduction of extracellular electron receptors. And, of course, by having so many cytochromes, the cells are themselves uh, red. So, this is the reason they are red. So, but having cytochromes doesn't expand all the electrons can send to outside the cell. So, these are not the main reason. The main reason is the way how these proteins are arranged within the cell. So, we have uh, cytochromes associated with the cytoplasmic membrane, also someone uh, located at the, the periplasm. <coughs> so these features are not new. All the bacteria have the electron transfer components associated with cytoplasmic membrane and uh, located at the periplasm. The novelty is that in this kind of bacteria, we also have cytochromes that are associated with the outer membrane. And this is the reason why this bacteria can send electrons to the exterior. So, this leads us to our first project that is running in the lab, which aims to elucidate the uh, <coughs> electron transfer pathways involved in the extracellular uh, reduction of receptors. And for, to do that, we need first to characterize the individual components in terms of structure and functional properties, and after, after that, we aim to understand which component gives the electrons to, to, to which, so which are the redox partners. So we started, started this project already. We started uh, by characterizing this family, which is composed by five uh, three heme cytochromes, and now we are moving for the characterization of the outer membrane uh, cytochromes. The main techniques that you use, we use are listed here, and with this we aim to determine the structure of the proteins, their functional properties, and which are the uh, redox patterns involved in these electron transfer uh, pathways. Just to give you, I avoid a lot of results, so I'm just showing now a couple of results. So, for the periplasmic family, we already have the, the structure of the five members of the family, and we have already characterized all the redox properties of these proteins. For instance, these two are designated PPCA and, and D, just because A, B, C, and D, there's no special reason. You see that they work at different redox potential ranges, and these two cytochromes are involved or can a couple electron and proton transfer, which might be important for ATP synthesis in these bacteria. Okay? The other two are these two. They were already characterized as well. They work in the different range, but they cannot perform this electron and proton uh, coupled transfer. Okay? So these are features. I mean, they are not all equal, okay? Although the structures are very similar, the functional properties are quite different. So by having, by covering different working uh, potential ranges, this might suggest that these proteins have different functional mechanisms and probably will interact with distinct uh, redox partners. Also, what we did was to establish the NMR fingerprints. What is this? So this is the NMR fingerprints, as we usually talk in the lab, are the, the chemical shifts of all backbone NH groups. So we identify all the NH involved in the peptide bonds, okay, in these proteins. So we know exactly the position for each uh, residue. And this is very important because this is the, the the main tool for us to study interactions. So let's imagine that we have this map, and if you want to, to check if another protein is a redox partner of this one, so we just have to mix them, and assuming that they interact in this region, so these signals will be affected in this spectra, so you can probe not only, you can evaluate that the protein might be a redox pattern, but also how they interact, so we can map that the region of interaction in the structure. So we started for, with, this, with this cytochrome, we tested for a small molecule which is used by the bacteria as electron donor. As you can see, we have a several uh, spectra superimposed here. Some signals doesn't move, 
but you can see some signals that are moving. So this is an indication that this compound interacts with this protein and also by analyzing the peaks that are moving you can calculate binding constant, association, dissociation constant, but more important you can map the region of, of interaction between the, in this case, the protein and the ligand. But we, we can do this between two protein, proteins. Okay, now probably I'm moving for another process, maybe more difficult to explain. But the idea is, okay, let's focus on PPCA, which is uh, one of the proteins that can co couple electron and proton transfer. And let's assume, let's pretend that feature is very important, okay? So we are interested to uh, find the residues that are responsible for that mechanism, okay? What are the, the residues that has a role uh, that allow the protein to couple electron and proton transfer? So we did a lot of mutants in this protein, we characterized the, the mutants, and just going back, you see PPCA and D, it was the, the two cytochromes that are involved in the electron-proton transfer. For today, it means red box, okay? When you see a red box, that means that protein can do electron and proton transfer. So, and by studying the mutants, we have some mutants that uh, disrupt this, this mechanism and other ones that keep that mechanism running, okay? So this is not very interesting because we just know, okay, this one, this mutant here can do the, can keep the mechanism, but now we know exactly where to touch in the protein in order to keep the same the functional uh, features of the protein, meaning in this case, electron and proton coupling transfer. But interestingly, ah, okay, I forgot this, this is just a feature. We, we found that only when M3 of this, this protein has three hymns, only, only when M3 is the last one, last hymn to oxidize, the proteins can do electron and proton coupling, okay? But it's just a curiosity. More important is, is this, because now we can uh, design mutants in order to put the protein working at lower redox potential. I mean, let's see this. The red, the red curve is for PPCA, and the black ones are for a several uh, a series of mutants. So let's focus on this one now. We can work at lower redox potential, which could be important because we are increasing the electron transfer driving force. This could be important for the cell. So now we can design proteins that can work at much lower redox potential by keeping the same features of the wild type. You see, KE43 e is one that can, still can couple electron and proton transfer, but it works at much lower redox potential, and that could be uh, helpful, and this, the cells can benefit from that. So that leads us to our third project. So has this any impact on, on biomass production? Because if you can have more biomass, you can, of course, have better a bioremediation process and probably you can also produce more amount of current. Okay, that's the idea behind this. So on the third project is, okay, we have mutants, we keep the functional properties of the wild type, the proteins are working at much lower redox potential, so the next step is to evaluate the performance of these mutants in the cells, okay? In general, in general terms, it means that you knock out the original gene and you replace that gene by the gene that encodes for the protein, the protein, and then you can evaluate the performance of uh, current production or um, the performance by uh, electron transfer to extracellular electron receptors and see if you, you can have a benefit from, from it. So in summary, the three projects are understand the, the pathways involved in extracellular electron transfer, try to design the mutants that might improve the, proper, the functional properties of the of these cytochromes and test these cytochromes 
uh, in vivo to see if you can really have an effect from the, these studies. Um, of course, this is a project that involves a lot of people. Uh, so this is my current team. We have a strong collaboration with two American universities, Massachusetts and uh, Chicago. I want probably for most of you is important. We have the Sequentron and the APS uh, facility for beams, beam lines. Also strong collaboration with uh, CISIC from Madrid with uh, Professor Marta Brooks and these two groups from, from Portugal. Well, thank you very much for uh, your attention. This is more biological than physics, no? Yes, please. Okay. What is the product of the reduction of the iron ferric iron hydroxides? It's a solvable Because they can use solvable and insoluble. Okay, so we have citrate, iron citrate. <coughs> The insoluble one. The insoluble one is, 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 is um, because if you rest it there, if you actually rest, this bacterium can actually um, dissolve it. Dissolve it, it turns out bad, but I'm not sure about the, the final product of that. So, but uh, the initial media looks like uh, brownish yeah. completely, and then as they grow, they start to solubilize the, the compound. It becomes sour. Yes, please. Um, just so, in theory, do you think that after studying all the proteins in the body, in the atomic pathway of geometry, um, you could uh, try to build a mimetic system, an artificial system, uh, that, had, that should have this uh, efficiency? Uh, we have two pro problems here. One problem is that the, the growth rates of these bacteria are very slow because they are anaerobic. So uh, our ultimate goal it was to identify the key components of the chain and probably we can clone those components. Let's assume that you just, we just need uh, four or five components and if you can then clone those uh, components in a aer aerobic bacteria that could be much better in terms of improvement of the, of the process. There are some attempts which were narrow ones in trying to clone some of these components in E. coli and E. coli that mutated strain can reduce extracellular components so maybe that would be the way, just identify the key ones and then try to make them work on a bacteria that grow faster. Yes. My question is about the, how you measure the potentials of the geobacter. Do you immobilize the geobacter? The, the, the cells, yes. they, they use voltammetry essentially and the measures uh, and now will work because we are measuring the redox potential of the proteins is quite different. You can use voltammetry, but in this case it's very difficult. And I know if your question is also related to the proteins. For the bacteria, you just put uh, an electrode and uh, do a voltammogram, normal voltammogram, you can get the potentials. For the proteins, it's more difficult because most of these proteins are multi, multi amic And for that, you need to combine uh, potentiometric measurements, which could be voltammetry as, as well, with NMR measurements, which I avoid here completely. So in order to get the redox potential of these proteins, we have to, we, we, you cannot just do a potentiometric uh, titration. We have to combine potentiometric measurements 
with uh, nuclear magnetic resonance measurements. The protein that you mentioned, it was in the, the cell wall, right? There is only one protein, or Which? Are there, are there, you said that there is a protein in the outer cell wall. Several, right? several ones. Is there there's one? only one protein? No. Uh, At least in this scheme, we have three proteins, but there is a lot of outer membrane proteins. But some of them are just are involved in the current production, other are involved in the iron reduction, other ones are involved in the uranium reduction. So you, you see? Have a lot of work. So this is a, this model here is just for the ones that were identif identified as participants in the iron reduction pathways. Okay, so we thank you for coming. Okay, so thank you very much, Paolo, for the introduction. And my talk is more coming back to the talks earlier by Eugen and by uh, Sam, because I'm going back on the molecular level and studying uh, radiation damage caused by low energy electrons, as I said, on the molecular level. But giving you first an overview again of uh, DNA damage by ionizing radiation, so, in principle, it's a very complicated reaction scheme on the first point of view, but finally it can be reduced, as mentioned earlier, essentially to two important species. So the first species is or are secondary electrons, which are formed by ionization of the DNA or DNA environment by the ionizing radiation. So one can follow then this step here, this reaction pathway, leading to the critical damage of DNA, which is a single strand break or a double strand break. And the other pathway is this going via the water, so the release of hydrogen uh, OH radicals and causing here single and double strand break. So as mentioned earlier, the direct damage is essentially as ascribed to low energy electrons while the indirect damage, this is ascribed to the OH radical. Now, this reaction scheme actually happens daily since everybody is exposed to ionizing radiation. But also the question is this, that this scheme is uh, valid in radiotherapy. And there the question comes then to the point, can we somehow uh, make two more cells where you have the, uh, the same process occurring, more sensitive to ionizing radiation. So this leads then to the question, which kind of radio sensitizers uh, could be uh, embedded in a tumor cell, which makes then the, the, the cell more sensitive to ionizing radiation. So this is the question where several uh, research uh, strategies and also investigations have been carried out. Uh, recent years to look for these some compounds which increase the uh, sensitivity of cells towards radiation. And there has been one, for example, mechanism or one compound suggested uh, recent years which are metal nanoparticles. And as Stephen Buckman uh, mentioned in the morning, since tumor cells are much more active than healthy cells, uh, this kind of compounds gets accumulated in tumor cells. And once they are irradiated then with high energy radiation, like for example here it's shown with a carbon 6 plus ion uh, beam, you see that here you have subsequent uh, secondary, electron pro uh, secondary electron production. And this is simply caused by, since we have here highly energetic radiation, you have inner shell ionization of these metals, which have high charge numbers, and subsequent OGA cascades, where you release then the lots of secondary electrons. And then the released secondary electrons, again, it's somehow related to the, to the slide before. You have then here the production either of uh, OH 
rich radicals, which again attacks the DNA, so you have indirect damage effects, as well the formed secondary electrons may directly attack in the DNA and cause more damage. So these metal nanoparticles, like for example gold or platinum particles, they were are actually uh, proposed to be uh, active as radio sensitizers. The other uh, strategy would be to combine chemotherapy and radiotherapy because actually these are two alternative therapies in, in, uh, concerning the treatment of tumors, so why not combine them? And then the question is which kind of molecules are particularly, I mean, which kind of uh, molecules which are used in chemotherapy are particularly sensitive to radiation or to the subsequent particles formed by the uh, ionizing radiation. So there was one uh, suggestion that this, uh, this platinum, which is actually known as a chemotherapeutic drug since uh, several decades, may be used in the, uh, as a radio chemotherapy uh, molecular agent. So if you look first in the chemotherapy action here, so we are, if you add the cis platinum molecule in a cell, and here we have as an example one DNA strands, this egg molecule undergoes first hydrolysis with the water surrounding the cell. So it strips off these chlorine atoms and gets some water adducts on it before docking here at the DNA. And as you can see here, it docked this, this it forms new bonds between two uh, nuclear bases in the DNA strand. So you can see here, this is possible here, or uh, in this case it's shown, this is, uh, this is another possibility, and these are called in the so-called intra-cross-linking here between the molecules. And this is of course uh, bad for the cell, because here by this cross-linking, you're making point mutations. And as we heard from the dogs before, finally this leads them to, uh, or may lead to cell de de degradation. Now, this molecule is now uh, well known for chemotherapy. Now one can combine it with, so to say, radiotherapy. And then, as, as I told you earlier, and we have heard in the earlier talks, we create a number of secondary electrons, those with low kinetic energies. And there was a reaction pathway uh, proposed recently when you have now this cis platinum molecule, which forms here this, in this case, an intra strand uh, muta point mutation in the DNA strand. Uh, it first breaks here these two bonds, and this leads them to the formation here of base-centered radicals. And in this case, this, this state here is then not stable, and instead you have then a hydrogen transfer from the, from the phosphate side here to the, to the nuclear base, and again you're creating here a radical side, and this finally causes a, a, a break of the strand. And since this the same is happening on the opposite strand, you see then finally you can create here in a quite simple reaction pathway a double strand break. So the question is now of course uh, how this mechanism works that the electron, a low energy electron, can cleave here these two bonds. And the mechanism proposed was that I think you heard it also earlier that dissociative electron attachment plays an important role. So just as a, a repetition of from what we heard earlier, so we have resonant electron attachment means we have low energy electrons with energies from about zero to 50 eV, and the electron attaches to a certain molecule or DNA site, it forms this temporary negative ion, and then in many cases it's lead to dissociation of, of molecules. And indeed it was shown going now back to the cis-platinum case, that uh, if we have a single cis-platinum molecule, uh, Eugen showed some years ago, that indeed the electron can cleave simultaneously two bonds in this cis-platinum molecule, so following exactly this pathway of uh, two-bond cleavage which I showed you before. 
Now the question is, of course, this platinum is one example, but other, other, other molecules, or even uh, molecules which even uh, causes more sensitivity of, this, of cancer cells. And for this, we are performing cross-beam electron, uh, electrons and experiments. So with a, actually the same setup which have been done in, in or yeah, which have been done in Berlin. So we have here a, mole, a molecular beam oven where we evaporate biomolecules or these uh, anti-cancer drugs, which I'm going to show you. Then we have here some monochromators where we first uh, form. Uh, an electron beam by thermally uh, emitting electrons from a hot filament and then for a better defined energy resolution we have here an hemispherical electron monochromator where we get then an energy resolution from about 100 milliEV. Then here in this interaction region we have then electron attachment processes where we form then anions from these originally here neutral molecules and the anions we ex extract here by weak electric fields towards the quadruple mass filter and then finally we detect here the anions by a, a secondary electron multiplier. So with this setup we were looking then for different kind of radio sensitizer molecules and one example uh, is a halogenated nuclear base which is for example is chloroacetyl as shown here so we have here the 5C, 5-carbon site, where in native uracil you have here a hydrogen, and in, in the case of the halogenated base you have, for example, here a chloride molecule, and uh, the, uh, it is famous uh, molecule, uh, the fluorouracil, uh, used in, in uh, chemotherapy since about uh, ten, 50 years ago, and if we look now here for the, let's say, electron scavenging properties of this molecule, uh, that means by measuring the resulting uh, dissociate, dissociative fragments formed by the electron attachment process, you can see here that we have here very effective uh, fragment ion production close to zero EV. And what is also remarkable is here the estimated cross-section for this kind of fragment ion formation because if we compare it here with the native uracil molecule, we saw that the DA cross-section for these hello uracils are about three orders of magnitude higher than for the native uracil. So it's just this what we want, that uh, this kind of uh, chemotherapeutical drugs are more sensitive towards radiation. And also Eugen, he measured some other halouracils and saw similar effects that in principle, since these halogen atoms are very attractive towards electrons, uh, that we see here a strong sensitizing effect in case of these molecules. Now some other molecule we, we studied recently were nitroimidazoles. This uh, kind of radi uh, radio sensitizers were used in chemist radiotherapy in Denmark and especially for hypertoxic tumors. And this here is the molecular structure of these nitroimidazoles, source, which maybe from a chemist's point of view it's an interesting molecule for a biomolecule because you have here an NO2 group, which actually, if you think of explosives, actually you have the same molecular, so to say, uh, ligand there. And if we uh, attach an electron, we saw that this molecule is very sensitive towards fragmentation. Uh, so we see that this, the molecular paradigm is not stabilized and it always dissociates. And for example, one uh, channel is the nitroimidazole uh, minus OH channel, where we see that we form this very efficiently here close to COEV in a very sharp peak structure which uh, for experts here in the audience we ascribe to vibrational Feschbach resonances and as well we see also some other low energy features here uh, with a little bit less uh, uh, intensity. Now very recently we also looked for ex effects when we slightly modify here this molecular structure because finally 
it's a question how one can, so to say, if you think, if you do not want to use current radio sensitizers, uh, it's, uh, you want to develop a new radio sensitizer. So it's very important to know, okay, how sensitive are these molecules towards modification of the chemical structure. And we did this, this modification in a very simple way by studying the molecule, actually this was a very recent study last week, uh, by putting here a methyl group instead of a hydrogen molecule. And as you can see here, we have already a very strong modification of the ion yield, so practically these lower energy features all disappeared. So you see the conclusion is that there is a very strong modification uh, of the ion yield on by the molecular structure, which is of course uh, important also by thinking that these molecules will be not isolated in the gas phase, but in the cell they are Im embedded in an environment. And this channel I just show you because it's also, if you think, we have here the loss of OH, and this is okay, OH radical, as I told you before, this is somehow related then to the indirect damage of DNA. So you see here somehow uh, a link that the secondary electrons create here also uh, in the uh, OH radicals responsible for the indirect damage. Now another molecule we studied recently was platinum dipromide, which is actually here, you can see the molecular structure. Uh, because there were also suggestions that this may act as a radio sensitizer. And what we saw when we looked in the mass spectra, we actually saw just the production of Br minus. And here, the, here you can see the subsequent ion yield as a function of the electron energy. And here I plotted two different oven temperatures, which means we, we uh, since we always heat the oven to produce uh, the beam of molecules, the neutral beam of molecules before the electron attachment. Uh, you can see here, first of all, uh, oven temperature of 370 Kelvin, which is here the triangle uh, uh, plot, and the elevated oven temperatures of 460 Kelvin. And as you can see here, there is a strong difference between these two oven temperatures. But finally, it turned out that here this very strong peak here is just an impurity. And this is a, a feature, I should say, from a dissociative electron attachment that the cross-section is very dependent, as, as you can see before, on the molecular structure. So even very small impurities, if they have a very high cross-section, they will, so to say, overlap with your cross-section from a compound which, which you measure, which apparently has a low cross-section. So this is a problem in, in general problem in uh, dissociative electron attachment studies. But since we by, since we measured different oven temperatures and we did some quantum chemical calculations, we could finally ascribe them here. Nevertheless, when we look at the ion yield at 370, 370 Kelvin, this resonance at 1.2 eV to the to the reaction channel where you form Br minus and BTPR. And here is high energy resonance at 7 eV, which is quite stronger than compared to the low energy resonance, where you have a complete dissociation of the molecule forming atomic fragments, where one fragment is, is negatively charged. So here we have the release of uh, charged and neutral bromine as well as the platinum atom. The motivation of this study was uh, Another recent study uh, where uh, a film of DNA uh, with mixed with different kind of radio sensitizers was irradiated with X-rays. And there, the this damage of these films was then studied as a function of the irradiation dose. So this is a kind of condensed phase experiment. And it, uh, three different kind of compounds were measured. So the first compound here in, in marked in the, the squares uh, is the cis platinum molecule, which I have shown to you before. Then the, the, the second compound was the brominated version of this cis platinum. That means the chlorine atoms were replaced by bromine atoms. And the third compound here in, shown in triangles, it was this 
platinum type bromide where we measured the, the uh, curves concerning electron attachment that I've shown you before. And if you look here at this uh, curve for the diff three different molecules, and here on the y-axis is plotted, so it's, that it's hardly visible, it's the linear DNA in percent, which means in this case, uh, it shows you the double strand break efficiency. Since uh, DNA in, uh, which has undergone a uh, double strand break goes into a linear form. And, sorry. I'm not so sure if I destroy it. <laughs> but maybe, but not to lose some time, I maybe speak like this. Uh, so we, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's okay, I think. I don't know how much time, I mean the time. It's okay. <laughs> really somewhat, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's actually, okay. I'm too fast today. <laughs> so from this, uh, you can see here the, the damage uh, as a function of the as, as a function of the dose for these three different uh, mixtures of DNA with the radio sensitizers. And as you can see here, uh, at least for the doses, uh, let's say carried out in this study. Only the DNA mixed with platinum dibromide showed an increase of the DNA uh, double strand break formation. While, for example, for the sample mixed with cis platinum, actually, at least in the doses used here, uh, no increase of the damage was observed. So, this is now somehow in the country which I showed you, which I discussed before, but I should say. Actually, the cis platinum sample will also show some damage, some increased damage, that means increased uh, double strand break formation, but only at higher doses, which were not carried out in, the, in this study here. So actually, one could see that, uh, that in case of platinum dipromide, you have a strong sensitization of the DNA towards double strand breaks, and this leads then to the proposal that maybe this would, will be, since this is just not used as a uh, radio sensitizer in therapy, that this may be a very efficient uh, radio sensitizing molecule in uh, clinical radio chemotherapy. Okay, this leads me already to the summary. And I've shown you some investigations on the radio sensitizing effect, uh, mainly caused by low energy electrons at the molecular level, and particularly in the case of nitro emitted soils ion yields, which are used as radio sensitizers. Uh, it has turned out that these are strongly dependent on the enzyme hydrogenation or methylation, and Important is always one looks also which kind of fragments one forms, and in the case of nitro cells, we see the formation of OH radicals, which are important for the indirect damage. And the action of PTPR2 may be released to the release of bromine atoms. However, I should say, in this case, for the platinum dipromide, the actual pathway from the initial electron attachment to the double strand break. This is not known like for the cis platinum yet. So this is somehow uh, the point and needs some further investigations. So from this I would like to thank uh, my collaborators in Innsbruck and particularly Katrin Danzer who did the uh, measurements and Stefan Huber who did the quantum chemical calculations. And I would like to mention the numerous uh, collaboration, the international ones for the case of nitro emitter source. I would like to uh, acknowledge Linda Feketeva and Eugen sitting in the audience. Then concerning the PTBR2 measurements, I would like to uh, acknowledge our Polish colleagues, and Andrzej Bels and Magusztos Mielek. And I should also mention uh, Ilko Bald uh, and Robin Schürmann. Robin is a student from Ilko and he's currently in our laboratories doing some investigations on brown adenine. So we are continuing our research in this in concerning radio sensitizers. And of course, I would like to mention our long, already long-time collaboration with, with Paolo and Felipe from 
uh, this one. So with this, I would like to show, come to the end, uh, <laughs> showing you some uh, season pictures from Innsbruck, which is actually a, a small city compared to Lisbon, about 120,000 inhabitants with 30,000 students. And usually in tourism, one calls Innsbruck in the heart of the Alps. So here you can see some impressions of the uh, surrounding of Innsbruck. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. are actually too strong radio sensitizers in this in this well, respect. Yeah. And um, it's, it's very beautiful work, very nice, but, but mm -hmm. be very careful how you interpret this at the technical level. When you talk to you'll find this out. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think that's also the reason why we, actually, uh, we are studying now currently more uh, chemotherapeutic projects, at least were known that they are somehow, let's say, used in chemotherapy. So then it's just a question how they respond to the radiation. I mean, the, the dream would be that you really start from scratch thinking of a molecule with a certain molecular structure where you know, okay, this is particularly sensitive to towards OH radicals or, or electrons. And then, so to say, go from this step to designing it uh, and developing a drug. But probably you heard it's extremely costly. <coughs> And it takes very long time from the starting of designing a drug since till finally it's approved for for the for the for the market. So uh, I'm, from this point of view, I'm a little bit skeptical. Um, well, I think mean, one should be very skeptical yeah. about the future experiments. I mean, the, these sort of experiments and their clinical application. There's an enormous distance between the two. Mm -hmm. The reason we should not care about the but I should say, at least for this fluorouracils, for the halogenated, these are used as radio sensitizers. So these were, huh? they are unused. They are unused. Yeah. yeah. So they were designed originally and used as chemotherapeutic drugs, but now they they also in the combined radio therapy used. Well, let's almost, yeah. of course also a question for local let's say treatment of, of patients with this kind of drugs and let's say a worldwide recommended drug which could be used and I don't think that this is now that we are, we are in the case or in the, in the, in the, at this time that one chemotherapeutic drug is worldwide accepted as a radio sensitizer. This is definitely not the case. It's a great idea radio sensitization. Yeah. Yeah, because it's usually, you also need to consider that, for example, these chemotherapeutic drugs, they have very strong side effects, so from this point of view. Uh, each, I think even a, a sensitized, or a, a, let's say a decrease or a, a, of side effects, let's say by 10, 15%, which means an enhanced increase by 
by this, this factor, by the radio treatment, it's already a great success. Thank you. Uh, you show that the equipment want to show the resonance profile for the uh, um, hydroxyl abstraction from the phenomena. Uh, Nitrate with the soil. Yeah, that first couple of things, which is the corroboration flash part structure, which is very similar to the primitive uh, devices, right? Yes, right. And then you have another peak. And mm -hmm. then you methylated it mm -hmm. in the right one position, and you only have the second peak. So uh, my first question would be. I want to confirm that by, by methylating the F1, you are no longer having the OH, OH neutral OH abstraction uh, from the N1. So the hydrogen should come from the N1 for those, right? Mm -hmm. And have you tried um, uh, to methylate in other positions to see from where, or do it right now, possibly, um, from where does that come mm -hmm. from? Actually, we, uh, we did not. Yeah, actually we did not, but I think one can also find this out by doing, uh, uh, even by doing quantum chemical calculations. So this would be quite easy to calculate the thresholds for hydrogen extraction from the different sides. But actually you're, uh, actually you're right, it must come from another position than the N1, since this is blocked, so to say, in this, in this words. Maybe it's, Yes. Uh, the yeah, the type of moment actually that's a very uh, good question because because uh, <laughs> we submitted this study in a, in a, in a journal and the uh, uh, referee uh, had a critical point on this concerning type of moment. But actually, the dipole moments, at least for these compounds, they are not, uh, by the methylation, does not uh, change substantially. Actually, we, we studied recently uh, also the, uh, an isomer of this methylated version by having here the, the NO2 group at this side here. And in this case, the dipole moments tra changes substantially. But the ions don't, do not change, at least qualitatively concerning resonance positions, but also in this case, if you have the NO2 group in this side here, this uh, resonance is close to zero EV, they are man managed, they are not present anymore. So from this. Yes, which uh, I guess as well as the dipole moment changing, you can also change the actual vibrational rates of the Well, I call not substantially. <laughs> You don't think that changing, you don't think it's significant enough to have a significant a tab of big effect on the vibrational flash back resonance system? Well, I think it's just the same mechanism as, as, as we studied for uh, the, the timing yeah, for the nuclear base case, that you have here these vibrational flashback resonances. But here, uh, for this molecule, it's quite remarkable that somehow uh, this vibra we see these vibrational Feschbach resonances, at least for the non-methylated case here, for example, in many channels. So we see it for the loss of OH. We see it also for the loss of N NO2. So this is in contrast to timing, because in timing we see these vibrational Feschbach resonances only in the loss of H in this position here. So this is a quite a distinct difference to this, to this, uh, to this, to the nuclear bases. The last question. Um, my question goes to your condensed phase settings. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I don't know the experimental setup. So, um, what I wanted to know is exactly how the experiment is done, or uh, and which type of DNA you use to. to uh, that's, a good, <laughs> that's a good question because this was not performed by me. <laughs> Actually, these are, these are the Polish colleagues and I'm a little, uh, to be honest, mm, uh, the exact DNA would not be able to tell you. Yeah, this is, this is for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is for sure, but, uh, but the actually, uh, let's say treatment or procedure, how the deposition concerning uh, the surface, the preparation, uh, this is usually some several steps uh, which, which actually 
Yeah. It's far more than the intensity of the plane. Yeah. She's a big expert. Yeah, my question is getting right. So, can you can explain that? Okay, well, I guess that uh, we should spot 